This is the Ohio Adult Allies podcast. Welcome. Here, our mission is to develop, inspire, and empower youth leaders. Our topic for today is how youth-led programs can address social determinants of adolescent health. With special guests, Christina Lada Landfield and Lake Miller. Now here's our host, Carly Griffith. Hello, everybody. It is such a pleasure to have this opportunity for the Adult Allies podcast. Um, we're having today Lake Miller and Christina Lada Langfield. And during today's session, we are going to be exploring ways that um, youth led prevention can impact social determinants of adolescent health. Our goal is for the listeners to walk away with innovative strategies um, that they can apply within their communities that will um, reduce barriers and create access. So I am the host today. My name is Carly Griffith. I am a prevention education provider for Talbert House serving Clinton and Warren counties. I primarily work in Clinton County with my youth-led prevention group in the Wilmington Middle Schools. Um, so if you, if you guys want to introduce yourself, you guys can go right ahead and tell us what you do and what your roles are within your organization. Uh, my name is Lake Miller. I see him his pronouns. I'm the director of education for the National Conference for Community and Justice of Greater Dayton. Um, we are a Dayton-based nonprofit working to address diversity, equity, and inclusion. We do that through a number of methods, but one of the big methods that we are utilizing here at NCCJ um, is youth leadership development. And through that, we have school programs that we host, camps that we host, but also part of that is um, youth-led prevention programs that happen here at NCCJ. So I'm excited to be part of this conversation and share more about my experiences and also some of the things that NCCJ is involved with. Well, hi, Carly. My name is Christina. Um, thank you for the introduction, and I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting us. Um, so I work at Envision Partnerships. We're located in Butler County and have been serving Butler County for over 50 years. Um, we started off as a treatment agency and then moved to treatment and, and prevention. Um, but in the mid 80s, we went to prevention exclusively. So we do a little bit of early intervention, but I'd say we're entirely in that prevention category. Um, we serve all of Butler County, all of the school districts in a number of ways but we also host three coalitions. And so I act as the director of community programs uh, within the agency. Um, and so we, I oversee the three um, coalitions, but then also a lot of our community-based work. Um, and certainly there's overlap when it comes to um, youth-led prevention, um, even some of the programs that we do, it might be in schools, but then also after schools as well. Um, so I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, so the purpose of this episode is to discuss how youth-led prevention programs can address those social determinants of adolescent health. Um, so I guess just to start out, um, how do you guys define social determinants of adolescent health? And um, let's just have Lake go first. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I think you could probably Google this and get a very technical definition. I mean, I think when you look even at social determinants of health, you're going to find definitions that are, you know, 15 page long research articles um, about what these look like. But to me, in, in its simplest form, I'm looking at um, what are those things that are happening in our community, things that are affecting our young people that then have a direct correlation to their health outcomes, right? So we're talking about like, what access to health do they have? What access to high edu or to quality education do these young people have? Um, are these young people facing discrimination, facing racism? Is there economic hardship in those communities? Um, what does the access look like um, to quality care and quality kind of self-care versus what does the access look like to like drugs and alcohol, for example? Um, and so the list goes on and on, I think, with what those actual items are that are affecting individuals' health outcomes, um, but we're really thinking about this exhaustive list of those community, um, those community items that are affecting those people's health outcomes. Yeah, I love the way that you frame that. Um, I definitely 
tend to approach problems from like a systems perspective. So as you were going through those, I was thinking about all of the sort of external factors on individuals. Um, and I think so maybe a little bit of a, a balancing counter is also the internal uh, interactions with um, all of those systems. So it's the personal experiences. So this is my own, you know, sort of take on it. It's personal experiences that people might have. Um, you know, you put 10 people in a room, something happens, and each one is going to perceive that a little bit differently, but it's still taking place within uh, a social space, so to speak. Um, and then it's certainly, you know, your peers and your parents and family and how those um, affect um, how you interact with the world and what those outcomes are. Um, as we know, we're talking about adolescents, and so peer uh, support, peer influence is huge, um, but so are the roles of parents and adults, and I think that we sometimes forget that. We think it's just all peer led or peer um, influenced, but they're really still um, affected by adults. And then certainly school environments, community environments, um, and how they, again, sort of walk through their world and how they experience it. But I think one thing that we all, I'm guessing, can say is, you know, if we're, um, I guess maybe I should just speak for myself, because I've just learned that this spring, I'm going to be hitting my 20 year high school reunion. And that is a wake up call for me. So 20 years ago in high school, things looked a little bit different, but um, my social experiences were mostly offline. Now, I don't know if the majority of them are online, maybe, you know, when they were at home doing school, the vast majority of them were, but I think that more and more we have to recognize that that online community is also another social determinant of health, um, and then how we adjust to that. I agree. I think that is really um, interesting, and it's definitely an emerging um, social determinant of health that you know, younger and younger, these uh, youth are exposed to. So going back to what you say about, you know, the families and their peers and just other adults in their life, whether that be coaches or mentors or counselors, um, how do you think that adult allies like us um, can educate the young people in their youth-led programs about the social determinants of health? You know, I think really our mentality here at NCCJ is really that like if we look at a room of young people, someone in that room already has the answer, right? Like as an adult, sure, I have all sorts of answers. I have all sorts of viewpoints on what's happening here, but there is a young person in that room who knows what's happening here, right? Who knows what these interactions are. They're aware of these issues. Um, we're living in this world. I'm glad that Christina brought up social media, which certainly can have these negative, you know, impacts on the health of people and it, and it creates um, sometimes really dangerous environments. But social media also for our young people is this like incredible pool of information, right? Like things that I am still today learning, I'll walk into a room with my young people and they're like, oh, Lake, let me tell you about X, Y, and Z that I learned on these TikTok videos, right? And certainly sometimes they go down these, you know, these rabbit holes and the information they're learning is incorrect. Absolutely. But oftentimes we find out, wow, they're really, they're really learning a lot about the world that even us as adults, as adult allies, we can oftentimes learn from that. Um, and so, you know, when I, when I approach this conversation with our young people, I always approach it with my first thought being someone in here already knows the answer. And that changes my role from strictly being educational to how do I surface those experiences, right? How can I use activities? How can I use interaction um, and Socratic seminars and all of these different, you know, modes of learning to have the students educate one another, to share that information they have. Um, I share with my staff all the time, like we have a 10 minute rule at NCCJ here. Like as an adult ally, I should never be speaking to my students for more than 10 minutes. Like once we've hit 10 minutes, it has gone far too long without some sort of interaction. It's gone far too long without them engaging in some sort of activity, right? Because we're not lecturers as adult allies. We are enabling our youth to have these really meaningful conversations. Um, and so I think that's a roundabout way to say, oftentimes it's not so much that I find myself educating our young people on these social determinants of health, but rather pulling that information out of our young people, right? Or giving them the tools to then go find out themselves um, where those things are happening. 
Um, it's also sometimes we do engage in a lot of activities that start to show how all of these systems are interacting with one another and how those systems can have an impact on somebody's health outcomes, um, on their financial outcomes, on their access to opportunity, any of these different things. So I know that's a, that's a roundabout answer, um, but I think we oftentimes don't give our young people enough credit for how much they truly understand and how much attention they are playing to how the world around them is shaping who they are and shaping in contrast who they are versus who someone else is in another community that maybe has differing, uh, differing realities or differing access to them. Yeah, I love that you mentioned the Socratic method because what I was thinking about was one of the major differences is that it's, when I think about adults and young people in youth-led prevention environments, I think about it as feeling social, feeling conversational, um, which to an outsider stepping into it could look like lots of different things that might not be prevention, right? Oftentimes, I think any preventionist would say, we have to do a lot of educating of people anyways as to what prevention is. Um, but I think with youth-led prevention specifically, uh, especially when you're in the schools and just starting off, um, sometimes it's hard to try to differentiate between, you know, what is it that we're doing versus um, an after-school um, program that's focused on community service, um, especially if community service is part of it. Or how is it different from leadership uh, development? Well, leadership development is part of it, but it's not all of what we're doing. Um, and so I think just in terms of sort of outsiders looking at what we're doing, sometimes it's difficult to even communicate what that is. I trust that the people listening to this um, probably have some experience with prevention. So we are probably in the same boat going, yeah, it is difficult. Um, but again, I think that informational conversational piece is really important. Um, I think starting off, it's just about asking what's important to them, you know, and, and that can be done lots of different ways. It can be done in a more formal way. Hey, we're going to do a check-in before we get started. Um, or it can just be, you know, sort of as conversation comes up or as things bubble up. Um, I'm thinking back to, um, actually it was, it was like the spring right before things shut down, um, in 2020. And it was almost a breakthrough moment. And I was having, there was a, a conversation with a group of young men um, in, there was a school time experience, um, and they started talking about, um, about home ownership, about taxes, and about um, not having, like, what their goals were. So it started talking about goals, and they were talking about they want money for this purpose, and then we were asking, you know, like, well, do you plan to buy a house at some point, or do you think you always rent? Do you want to buy somewhere outside of the city? Um, and then that conversation led down the path of, um, well, do you know what you get to do when you're a homeowner within a city? And do you know what that kind of power you know, provides you with? And having say over these things that you're concerned about. Um, and I see that as being, you know, I said a breakthrough moment because here's this group of students who, you know, were sort of angry at the system. And just by having conversations, we were able to educate, but not in this top down kind of way, but it was through their own experiences and saying, um, I want to, you know, I want to make money. I want to make something of myself later and not truly understanding what that means, but then talking about, well, here's what, here's how those dollars put into home ownership can affect policies that affect your education, the same things that you're concerned about. And so I think that's just one sort of example that popped into mind as Lake was talking and how um, it's so, it, I think the conversation is key to how we go about youth-led prevention. Yes, I definitely agree. I've had some um, breakthrough moments through conversation with my youth lead group too. And they're just like, oh, you know, it kind of clicks with them. Um, not by anything I've said, but just what they're talking about. So um, I guess how can other adult allies kind of link that education piece, whether it's to or from the youth um, to action? Well, you know, I think sometimes when we're talking about this link, this is where it kind of gets where it kind of gets tricky, right? Like, because as an adult ally, I think our job is to give young people the tools to be able to pursue action, but not to say, hey, here is the action that we're going to do, right? Um, and so I love, you know, Christina just or Christina had just mentioned, like, 
they started by kind of identifying what is that problem or what is that goal that we have, right? And this is oftentimes how we approach our conversations with our students. We, we are, we're a diversity and inclusion nonprofit. Um, and as we know, and we kind of look at these social determinants of health, like diversity and inclusion are very much um, interwoven into every aspect of this conversation. And so our students come into this conversation like super invigorated, um, super frustrated oftentimes at the systems that have caused this. Um, and I think that oftentimes like my adult reaction can be like, ooh, I've seen people excited or upset about this exact issue that you are. And here's what they did to get to a, a good place, right? Like, and put that action in front of them. Say, here's what other communities have done. Um, but I have to check myself oftentimes, be like, wait a minute, that's not how this process goes, right? You know, we have a whole process outline that we can go through with our young people to say, like, what's the problem and brainstorming ways to respond to that problem. And they can take it upon themselves to look at other communities. Um, but I think that from my perspective, and Christina, if you, if you differ, I, I definitely would love for you to say, from my perspective, it can be helping them with that process but I can't tell them here's the action that we should pursue, right? We oftentimes use the analogy of a train, right? And we say like, as adult allies, we identify ourselves as a train track versus our young people have to be the train. So we can help guide them, right? To where they need to be. But at the end of the day, they need to be that train pushing this force forward. Um, because I can say, hey, this worked really well in Yellow Springs, but my kids here in Dayton may say to me like, that is not gonna fly in our community or, maybe that's just really not what we're interested in. Um, and so to me, linking that education to action is really a process. Um, it's a process that utilizes bringing the conversations and the ideas of our young people to the forefront and giving them the tools to take those goals, to take those problems that they've identified and put it into action. Yeah, I was thinking about the the train piece. And I think that, you know, we, as adult allies, it is our role to be an expert in some ways. And I think the way that we need to be an expert is in the resources available, is in um, sort of having what's, what are the resources, what is the sort of political climate around certain things to help be that guide. So um, another just quick example that popped in mind. Oh, and also that um, the processes can be sh can be short and fast, right? Or they can or they can be short and long. Um, so it could be something that here's something we want to look at, and um, we're going to work through this entire process. And it might be um, six months or a year before we actually see some progress done on it. Um, and that's just the case with anything, right? Especially if it has to do with policies, it could be you know you could have someone who's in ninth grade, and it might be their senior year that they finally see that being implemented. Another good point I think for adult allies is to help remind them that um, it may feel like a lifetime if it's ninth to 12th grade, but really progress is the point. It's not necessarily about, we've got to make this happen right now. But when I say that it can happen fast, it's that it can also be sort of on the fly. And I think that, again, going back to us being um, experts about what's available in our communities. So I was um, just volunteering at um, a job fair that our Chamber of Commerce put on a few years, well, they would do it every year and they would do it in the school gymnasium. And they would have groups of students, like two or three, and you wouldn't know them um, going into it, but they would match you with, so an adult would be matched with these youth. And it was really just meant to, to be an assistant as they walked around to wherever they wanted to go. So as I was getting to know these, young people, um, one of them was really complaining a lot about, and I say that in a good way, right? Like had a lot of concerns uh, about things that were going on in the city. And I went, oh yeah, the city of Hamilton, um, which is where we are, the city of Hamilton um, actually has a table set up like to share about internships that are available and about job opportunities, things like that. So I said, let's, let's come over. I wanna introduce you to a couple people. Um, and, you know, allowed them said, hey, here's the people right here. Why didn't you tell them what you're concerned about? Um, and then I, what led from that was lots of different things It, you know, I think in that moment, it was, I want to hear what your opinions are. Here's some things that we're doing about it. 
If you're interested in an internship or in working with us later, that's great. That youth walked off, he did whatever. But what could happen is maybe the next time you see that person, you say, you know, hey, what was the follow-up to that? How'd that go? Um, and also asking, what would you change about it? And I think that, you know, that goes way back to what Lake was saying in terms of the people in the room, the youth in the room likely have the answer. Um, but even asking the question, well, what would you do about it? How, you know, what kind of change would you like to see, I think is a, is a good place to start. So um, again, I think just in terms of other adults, um, I think if you're first starting off in youth-led prevention or you're, maybe you got a job and you're new to a community, I think the best thing you can do um, is to get to know the organizations, the systems, the leaders, um, the workhorses in the community so that as youth come up with um, things that they want to address, you can co start connecting them to those people. Absolutely. I, I think that is awesome. Um, so I guess if you guys wanted to provide any specific examples of strategies that your youth-led prevention group has implemented to address these social determinants of adolescent health. So one strategy that our um, youth coalition has uh, taken up recently is about a year and a half ago, uh, we started meeting with a new group of youth and they surprised us, frankly, by saying, you know, what's really important to us is vaping. Like all of our, you know, of course it's how they feel, right? feels like all of our uh, classmates are going to the bathrooms and vaping in between and the teachers aren't doing anything about it and they're just ignoring it and nobody's doing anything about it at the admin level. Again, it's how they feel. It's their experiences. We're not there to tell them, well, that's not true, but it was really important information. What was surprising about it is we as the adults in the room, I think, come into that, especially around prevention and we go, oh man, the data shows vaping is an issue. We, gotta, we have to address that. We've got to focus on it. And we didn't even have to say anything. They already knew it. And so they, they wanted to do something about it. Now, on another level, something else that was already happening was we were working on some tobacco policies at the city level. We are also working with the school district on some alternatives to suspension programming. Um, <laughs> and so that part we could sort of work on in this, you know, this higher level, we're continuing to do that. But again, going to them and going, oh yeah, this sounds like it's you know really important to you. What are some things that you would like to do about it? And what they came up with was, you know, we want to talk to the teachers. We want to know, we want to let them know that this is important to us, that we don't like it. We're also not using it. Um, we want to help educate them that they're using, you know, our peers are using in the classroom. Um, and what to look out for. Um, and so they were looking for adult allies within their own school building to help address this issue that they saw as interfering with their education, but then also because of course they were concerned about their friends, you know, and knowing like, ah, this is, this is not a healthy um, coping skill. It's not a healthy, um, they just shouldn't be doing it. Um, so that was, that was really useful. And then as time sort of progressed and we're getting closer to trying to pass some policies at the, at the city level, we're then able to bring them in um, because they were already passionate about it to write support letters, to present in front of uh, city council, um, to let them know. Um, and it was sort of an easy process. You know, sometimes it's not as easy. Sometimes you're sort of pulling teeth to go, oh, how do we get some youth to go and <laughs> present? But in this specific case, um, they already came to us saying, we, we want to change something about this. And we were able to sort of provide the opportunity to them. Yeah, I love that. And, and kind of thinking about changing these environments, um, I think kind of a similar process to, Christina, what you're providing, we've applied um, in a lot of our schools. So, you know, again, our work is all around diversity and inclusion. And um, especially at our younger levels of youth-led prevention, um, this Kind of diversity and inclusion work starts to really show up as bullying and harassment um, in our younger students, right? Um, we see these bullying behaviors, we see harassment based on identities that makes one person different than another, and our students are really aware that this is happening. And so, 
you know, again, as we kind of start our conversations with students, we start by having that open conversation of like, what are the problems that you are noticing? Like, what are those things that are affecting you? And for a lot of the, the students around our table, they were saying similar things to what Christina's students were saying about vaping. Like the behaviors of others in the building are making it harder for us to learn. And quality education is so important for students, right? Um, and it's really tied to these health outcomes that individuals are having. And so we start this conversation with being like, all right, so we have students who are frustrated because they have some sort of barrier that's being caused by the, the peers around them that's causing them to not have a quality education. And we identify with the students that that is caused by bullying and rather is being caused as well by huge amounts of fights inside some of these buildings, right? Where every day these students are being pulled out of their classroom for numerous fights. And so our conversation with the young people starts to become, what can we do to address this problem? From your perspective, how can we solve that problem? Um, and a, a, a strategy that we kind of learned actually from the Montgomery County Prevention Coalition um, and have started using in our own projects is like, let's throw out every sense of realism for a second, right? Like, let's throw out a budget, let's throw out timelines, let's throw out all of that, right? And for a moment, let's have a true, there's no bad idea brainstorming session, right? Where like, put what you got forward. How do you think we could stop these bullying behaviors? How do we think that we could show someone when they're in a situation that's frustrating to them that they can respond in a way that's not bullying? And let's throw out all of those things that hold us down, right? And so they throw out ideas. And some of these we know are gonna be impossible. Um, right off the bat, right? But let's get them all down on paper and then let's start to identify what are those top three, what are the top one that we're actually gonna do um, and go through this process. And just as Christina said earlier, sometimes this process is gonna be done in a flash for us. And sometimes this might be something that we're working on over a multi-year period. And so with our students, what we really determined was the biggest problem that was happening in some of these schools is that when students were facing these frustrating situations, they did not have the personal tools um, to actually respond to that in a positive way. That rather the students in these schools faced a frustrating situation and their response to that was, we feel that we need to re respond with violence, right? And that responding with violence was interrupting their educational process. And so we were able to go through this whole process with them and we have different groups in these schools who are working on different efforts to respond um, to this issue, but we're really addressing it with the students from this environmental standpoint. How do we change the culture of a school to first of all, give students the tools to respond to whatever's going on in their life in a much more positive way, but also what happens after? Because we find that that's oftentimes so forgotten in these conversations. If there's a fight in somebody's classroom and those students are pulled out, maybe they're suspended, maybe they're expelled, whatever happens to those students, um, <laughs> that doesn't change anything, right? Like the climate is still the same. All of that stuff exists in this ecosystem. And so the, the other part of that is how do we now respond? Like when something's happened, how are our students able to change that climate into, you know, we talk about restorative justice and I, I, would, I love the whole conversation of restorative justice, but how do we now go into this procedure of kind of repairing the environment? So um, we've, entered into some really interesting conversations with our young people, but, you know, the conversations in all of our schools are different. And I think that that's really the vital, the vital piece of this. Awesome. That was, that was amazing. Um, and I agree with both of you. I think those are great strategies. Um, how can we as adult allies ensure that these strategies are intentional and intentionally selected to address the social determinants of adolescent health? Well, I'll, I'll just start off by saying that I think the, one of the most important things is to make sure that we have a broad representation of youth. Um, and again, maybe I'm thinking more from the perspective of um, youth-led prevention or coalition work that's, be, that's new, right? So when you're trying to first get people involved, you're going to do that sort of however you can. You're going to get as many people there as possible. Um, but I think having a broad representation is really important because we're talking about social interactions. And so if you fill a room with um, people, uh, you know, I don't want to classify, but, but people who are very similar, however that might be, um, based on their grades or based on their interests or whatever that might be, 
um, I think that you know you lose something. So first of all, is just how do you make sure that you've got a broad representation? And of course, you know we're we're talking about the strategic prevention framework. So cultural competency is in the middle of that. We've got to have people in the room who who fully represent. Um, the the makeup of if it's the school or the community. Um, I think another piece is again helping to understand that there's going to be long term development that happens. So um, if you're starting off and you've got you know a few youth, um, there might be times where it's it's a little bit more uh, relaxed or casual, um, and you're sort of you're building that. Um, so it's going to take a year or two years or three years before you start getting um, a really solid group um, where they can start taking more leadership roles within it. So I'm not saying that adults take over, right? I like your 10 minute rule. So you still want to keep it the 10 minute rule. But just in terms of it, the, the workload is going to shift where you can start giving more and more responsibility to the people, the youth who've been there for two, three years. Um, and then it might still take another five or 10 years before you can maybe start building in where you've got uh, older youth who've been involved for, for, for a few years um, who can be doing the training of the younger youth, whether that happens over the summer, or it happens in the beginning of the school year, whatever that might be. So just keep in mind that it, it takes a while um, and to give yourself a break. Um, if you're new and you're starting off and you're like, why don't I have this room filled and we should be doing all of these things? Um, it takes a little while. So, so that's okay. Um, and then, of course, I think that, again, using the SPIF model, um, we want to be data informed, but not data heavy. So, again, how do you utilize whatever um, surveys you're using? Um, how do we engage youth in doing some uh, informational gathering, whether it's environmental scans, um, which is, I, I love environmental scans. I love the concept of doing that. Again, we've got online opportunities for that as well as let's go for a walk down Main Street and uh, see what we see. Um, everything from, you know, hey, in front of this store, there's like always a ton of cigarette butts. Why is that? Um, or it's advertising we see on stores. Um, and again, like that's relatively simple, but it's so important. And then um, having them lead some of the conversation. So um, having conversations that are, I'll say, put it in quotes here, um, key informant interviews, because that's so formal um, language, but involving them in the process of maybe interviewing some of the leaders in their community, whether it's, hey, school admin staff, we want to interview you. We want to ask you about what you're um, seeing and experiencing um, to gather that information. Um, so again, I think those are just some of the sort of basis, basics that I would say, um, especially to new people as they're starting off either in the field or starting with a new coalition. Um, it takes time, you know, give yourself uh, leeway on that. Um, have your sort of ducks in a row, you know, know what the goals are, but let them lead it. Yeah, I, I totally agree with everything that you said, Christina. And I think, you know, when I first started my prevention journey, um, I was really obsessed with this idea of data, right? I think probably a lot of us are, this idea that all of our work should be driven by the data and all of this thing, or all of these things. And what I've recently, I think, kind of had to, had to balance is like, you know, data is important, but data also sometimes doesn't paint a full picture. Um, you know, so for example, like in our community, I'm leading an effort to um, to prevent suicide by falls. So whether that be from parking garages or bridges or all of the all of these different areas that people die by falling. Um, and what we found is like that data around suicide is horrible. You know, I mean, we all know this. There's no secret to that. You know, this is only showing people whose death certificate said suicide. It's not people who died of complications. It's not people who attempted, you know, and so I started this process really only wanting to look at where the data went. And I think that sometimes too, those anecdotal stories are important, um, you know, to our students who said like the vaping in my school is causing me to not be able to engage in my education in the same way. Like maybe the data doesn't show that that's truly the problem. Uh, but for those students, that is the problem. And so I think it's so hard to find that balance of like, 
we want to be data informed, but we also want to be people informed. Um, and I love that Christina had mentioned, you know, cultural competency needs to be at the center of all of this. And, and we see that, of course, through the SPIF, that cultural competen competency is at the center. However, I think cultural competency is oftentimes, this is, this is my view as someone in diversity and inclusion, I see this all the time. Uh, cultural competency is oftentimes mistaken as being equivalent to diversity, right? And diversity is simply the presence of difference. That's it, right? Having diverse people around the table. Um, and sometimes for some individuals, cultural competency stops at just diversity, right? And misses the mark on the inclusion aspect. And what I've seen far too often is that we have a conversation, we have a round table, we're talking about these issues, but not all of the diverse perspectives are actually being heard or sometimes are even strategically being overlooked, right? Um, and so it's so critical that we have those people at the table, but it's also so critical that we make those individuals know that their voices are heard and their voices are important. And I'm sure, Christina, that's what you're doing, but just as a diversity and inclusion organization, it's so crucial for me to always say that because I think um, sometimes we expect that if we bring the people to the table, the, table, the people are going to speak, right? That they're going to make their voice heard. But that's not always the case, right? Um, we have to invite people to be heard. We have to appreciate the things that they say. Um, and for some populations whose voices have oftentimes been strategically overlooked, if we blow past something that they say one time, it's very possible they're never going to make that voice heard again, right? Um, and so our ability to hear what others have to say um, is so critical. So I definitely agree with everything that uh, Christina had mentioned. And I think at the end of the day, when I'm looking at what are we working on, how are we starting, how are we kind of addressing um, these issues, it really starts with the people, what's affecting the people in our community. Um, I also think, Christina, that environmental scans are wonderful um, and can really address a lot of great concerns that are arising in our communities. Um, but having conversations, right, and having conversations in places that maybe we don't normally have those conversations, right, like actually bringing ourselves into the community. I was doing some research um, about a year ago on like how to have inclusive um, environments, and one of the things that people talked about the most was like we have to be in the community. If we're not having those conversations at the local coffee shop, if we're not having the conversations at those local neighborhood school centers, um, but rather expecting people to come to us, we're missing a lot of voices. I agree with both of those. Um, I think that is awesome. Um, I think those are great pieces of advice. And I think those are things that I would have liked to know when I started out. My youth led prevention group is in their infancy. Um, we've only been a group since August of 2021. Um, so I think you guys are really knowledgeable and it's just awesome to see how intentional your work is and what you guys are driven by and, and how you guys work. I think that that is so important for new people coming into this field or maybe um, not just coming into this field, but maybe starting a youth led prevention group. I think that was great advice. Um, the more knowledgeable we are, the more intentional our work is, and the more effective the outcomes can be. So um, to everyone watching, I hope this is a huge help to you. I know it was a huge help to me. And I just want to thank you guys again, Christina and Lake, for sharing all of your experiences and knowledge with all of us. Um, it has really been a pleasure to um, get to talk to you guys today. Thank you to our special guests. For more information about their organizations, feel free to use the information on screen. Thank you to our listeners. This has been the Ohio Adult Allies podcast. For more episodes, you can find us on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube by searching Ohio Adult Allies. You can also find our episodes and more information about us at OhioAdultAllies.com.